Biali, everyone. Yitzli here. All right. Well, I'm moving on to the fourth part of this calendar series by popular demand. So many people have been reaching out and asking really, really good questions. So I think that uh, several of you are ready to move on to the, the next part. This part is the most important. This is the most important calendar uh, episode because it it talks, it explains the leap year and the secondary the secondary calculation, the correlation or um, correction, sorry. But more than anything, I'm going to introduce to you the the calendar from um from a 100% decolonized view. Okay, so I, I talked to you about Caso, I've talked to you about Tena and those and those correlations and and just how those correlations are just very Eurocentric, right? And and Rafael Tena, I told I showed you the the link where he acknowledged that himself, right? Like we're we're always aligning to the Gregorian dates. It's gonna there's all it's always gonna be problematic. And every single correlation out there, except of course for the Ruben Ochoa, it does that, right? Like for example, there's a, the Arturo Mesa. They started the new year when? On March 11th or 12th. You know, uh, they started on a Gregorian date. And then Tena starts on a Gregorian date. Caso on a Gregorian date. Th that's a completely colonial view of the calendar because we, our people did not know anything about the Gregorian calendar. So it's completely nonsensical to say those things. And so one of the things that Ruben Ochoa, the you know, the, the discoverer of this, this correlation always says is, you know, we, we, we don't want to like when we're making, you know, cause me and Curly Tlapoyawa were, uh, you know, his, his first students who kind of applied what he taught us. Right. And made calendars and uh, these online calendars and the physical calendars and planners and all those things. And so the thing that he <laughs> really annoyed him was that we always put the, Gregorian days. Ah, you shouldn't even put the Gregorian day at all, right? Because it it just makes it Eurocentric and it makes you kind of reliant on it. And uh, you know, our argument is well, people are not gonna know what day it is unless we use that date because that's what we use today, you know. But he's he's definitely a proponent of just completely decolonizing the calendar 100 percent and so one of the things that he says that a lot of people do not understand or misinterpret, uh, and this is one of the, the most common errors and misconceptions that I see, is a lot of people will be like, oh, the new year starts on the spring equinox. Or they'll say, oh, I went to the NASA website and they said it's the spring equinox today, right? But the new year does not start until the observable spring equinox in Mexico. Okay, all of those words are completely crucial to that understanding. Once again, the observable spring equinox in Mexico. So what it comes down to is how did our people uh, monitor the spring equinox? How, how did they observe it? And why are we using Mexico, right? Well, <clears throat> that was the easiest one to answer because we're talking about the Mexica Azteca calendar that was used in Mexico Tenochtitlan at the time of the Spanish conquest, right? And so where are they located? They're located in Mexico, right? And so that's why we need to use Mexico when we're calibrating our calendar because the, the entire calendar is based in that location. And so that's that's the easy explanation for that. But the, the rest of it, the observable spring equinox, that's going to take a little bit more uh, effort. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to introduce you to a tool that I use. It's called Stellarium. This is a tool that uh, Ruben introduced to me because one of the first questions I had when I when I first when he, when I first talked to him about the, the calendar, right, is that, OK, you're talking about like what can be observed in 1519 and 1521, right, in Mexico, Tenochtitlan. And I told him, well, the, the, the Templo Mayor is not even there anymore. It's, it's in a museum. It was toppled over by the Spaniards. You know, a lot of these, uh, no, the, the entire city was destroyed, right? And there's nothing left in Mexico, Tenochtitlan. And, he's, and I said, so how, how are we even supposed to 
no, how, what are we going to do, build a time machine? And that's when he told me about Stellarium. So let me uh, let me show you Stellarium. Okay, so here it is right here. And so <clears throat> I've, with, this is a really cool, it's an astro astronomy program, and you can actually, you can actually see at any point, any time, and any location, uh, what the sun, what the sky looked like at that time. So it's an extremely valuable tool in our work here because we can literally go back in time and see what our ancestors were looking at and what led them to start their calendar on, you know, on the day after the observable spring equinox. And so we have this is Mexico City. So if you're using the Stellarium program, and uh, I'll put a link in the in the YouTube description. If you want to look into it, uh, you want to make sure you set the location. And there's a little little bar right here. You can set the location here. Okay. And then uh, I set it to today, which is the observable spring equinox in Mexico. And I'm just going to show you. This is the sun rising. Okay, at the horizon. So this is what our ancestors did thousands of years ago. There's so much evidence that they just started with a little piece of stone, you know, a stick or a stone, and they plopped it in the ground, and they said, all right, let's track the sun, see what happens. And so the first thing I want you to notice, I'll go a little slower, is as the sun rises, okay, in the sky, one thing you, you should notice is that it does not it does not follow a straight line. Do you see how it's curved? Okay, and so that that is going to be something we need to be aware of as we're looking at Stellarium. Okay, it's curved, and so the brilliant thing is the thing about our ancestors is, is they took that into account. You know, they they would. They would build a Teocali, right? There are astronomical observations. And then they would be like, no, that's not right. And they would completely tear it down. Like it happened. Motegosoma did it in Mexico, Tenochtitlan. He said, no, that's not accurate enough. Let's tear it down and remake it so that it's accurate. And so a lot of a lot of the buildings in Mexico are like um they're they're not true east. They're kind of over here rather than directly in the middle of east to account for the heights of the buildings right to account for the height of the buildings and whatever marker was on the top let's say for example they put a little marker marker is just like the place where you look to see where the sun will be uh for that spring equinox and that, that that's how you know it's the spring equinox right and so they would they would make it precise and they would rebuild these Teokali all the time in order to improve their accuracy. And so the ones that we have still today, they're, you know, it's like hundreds of years of like rebuilding and measuring and until it's right. Oh, look, I happen to make it just right. And so your son, and this is where you notice a lot of the Teokali, you know, I, I, I mentioned the Templo Mayor, and from Mexico, Tenochtitlan, that, that thing has been toppled. It's not even there anymore. So we cannot even go there and see. Although the astronomer, the uh, the, the archaeologist in charge of the Templo Mayor, has, has, his name is Leonardo Lujan, and he has um, made calculations. And he said, yeah, the, the top, he has determined that the top of the Temple of Mayor was exactly aligned to the spring equinox, okay? And so there's other astronomers kind of trying to rebuild it. Obviously, it's going to be very hard and very imprecise because it's not there anymore. And so luckily for us, we have the Ocali that are still standing all throughout Mexico and that are still aligned to the sun, let me show you, uh, and I'll put a link for this as well in the YouTube description. This uh, this is Al Tajin. It's one of the one of the Teocali in Mexico, and so you you will be able to see exactly what I'm talking about when I plug it in here. 
but it's basically just the background <clears throat> and the precise location of it. Um, so really, really helpful. And so we can imagine Templo, Templo Mayor would be something very similar to this, okay? Uh, so let me just erase these markings here so you can see it, all right. And so you're gonna go down to sky and viewing options, go to landscape, pick the El Tajin, and voila, you will see that it is now on the screen. And so we have <clears throat> this Teocali, like I said, just like the Templo Mayor in, in Mexico, Tlaxcala, you've got the sun right in the middle. You see that? And so that's the really beautiful thing about this. It's like, man, they could destroy the Templo Mayor, right? But we still have, and this is only one example of a Teocali that's in line. There are some others that are just magnificent in the Maya region uh, all over the place i'll show you i'll show you uh, another one in a minute but i want to show you this because <clears throat> the spring equinox is in the middle and i want to show you why it's in the middle as i as i said before in, in the previous lesson the Tena lesson you know the indigenous people could start their year whenever they want right that's we're not saying we're not saying that all indigenous people started the year on spring equinox. That's another misconception that people have. We're not saying that. We're saying that the, the Mexica in Mexico, Tenochtitlan, definitely did. We could prove that with 100% certainty. Other groups, I don't know. We know that the Maya had a lot of structures where it was aligned to the, the Zenith Passage in Mexico. The, the zenith passage is a very interesting phenomenon where the sun is in a position where if you look down, your shadow disappears. There's no shadow anymore. It's just the angle where the sun is. That fascinated our ancestors. They really thought that was really crazy that our shadows could just disappear, right? And so they had a lot of buildings aligned to that. And so some of them started their calendar on that date, okay? And so... Uh, <clears throat> that, that's the difference between the Mexica and other groups. But the Mexica definitely spring equinox. I'm going to show you in a few minutes how we know that. But for now, now that we're here, I'm going to show you something very important that our ancestors discovered thousands of years ago, which must have been in the, in the Olmec time, because the Olmecs were the first ones to come up with this system. But what they discovered is that the sun changes position throughout the seasons, okay? And so the spring equinox is actually the middle part. Let me go back. Uh, yeah, let me go back to December. Okay, so look, December, this is the December uh, winter solstice, right? In a lot of indigenous cultures, this is actually the beginning point for, for tracking the sun. You know, you start in winter. Um, metaphorically the the sun dies in the winter and so it's strengthened as it goes again so it's 12 okay so you have uh you have winter the next one is going to be the next season is going to be spring so it's spring equinox here now watch what happens when we go to summer do you see do you see how the sun is moving across the sky right and so it started off here, but now it's over here. And not only is it over here, let me go back. It's actually, you see how it's like low here and then it's high here? Our ancestors thought that, you know, they invented rubber. The first people in the entire world to invent rubber. When the Spaniards came, they, they saw it and they, they were amazed by it. They had never seen anything like it. And our ancestors... Um, made rubber and it was a is a sacred it was a very sacred substance still is today one of the many reasons why it's sacred is because they said that the sun they likened the sun to a bouncing rubber ball you see how it's bouncing that's what they said the sun was the sun was a bouncing rubber ball it's going up and down bouncing up and down 
And so that's the significance of rubber. I mean, rubber was a very popular offering. I mean, there's rubber balls everywhere, not just to play the ball game, but like literally offerings to the Tateo because it's like a sacred representation of the sun. And then watch what happens as we go to the fall. You see the fall? The fall kind of goes back close to where the spring was. And if you know anything about astronomy, that that, that is actually, uh, there's a reason for that as the sun is going around the, as the earth is going around the sun, you know, it's gonna be in a very similar position. So you got the fall, the sun, and then it comes back. And so it's just going back and forth. Okay, but the cool thing about this, the Alcali, is that you, if you wanted to mark all of these, you can actually put markers for all of them, right? Which is what a lot of groups did. And so that's the power of using this. One thing I want you to notice that's gonna be very, very important uh, in my then the next part here is that the sun is here the distance here okay from the ground is sizable see if this was not here and I mean this would be the horizon the sun would be visible at six. Okay, you can't see it here because it hasn't it hasn't reached the top of the Teokali, but if the Teokali was not there, you would be able to see it. Now this matters a lot, okay, which I'm, I'm gonna show you in a, in a few minutes why, but I want you to remember that. And so here we have a, a breakdown of the years 1519 to 1521. Now, I'm going to answer the question now, like, how do we know that the New Year starts one day after the observable equinox in Mexico? As I told you, Alfonso Caso has two correlation dates, okay, that he says are the most reliable. And if you look... There's a there's a book I think it's called uh, the Book of the Days or something by this this author named Edward Monroe, and the entire book is just a listing of all of the dates that were documented by Native people and by Spaniards back in the 15, 16, and seventeen hundreds. And one thing you notice that Caso discovered is that the dates. And 15, between 1519 and 1521 are very uh, reliable in the sense that everybody who wrote them down, they wrote the same date. As you get past 1521, that synchronicity disappears. And, you know, there was other events that happened. Everybody would write it down and the dates did not match. Even the dates before this time did not even match. From the two authors that we're writing okay and so that's why these castle dates are so important because we have to anchor these this calendar using reliable dates that are valid and in this case we know the fall of the the fall of Tenochtitlan is gonna this is the most important date of them all and as Caso shows Every Spaniard and every native person who had a pen, they wrote down that this event happened on one coat in the Mexica calendar, and they and they wrote down that this corresponded to 8-13-1521, which was August 13, 1521. This is the Julian calendar. Okay. And so what Ruben did, which I don't know why nobody else ever thought about that. But he counted backward until he got to the, the starting date. And if you don't know what I'm talking about with the starting date, you got to go back to lesson one because I covered that in lesson one. But basically, since the day, since the year is three Kali, three Kali, that means that the, the we know that the new year has to be three Osomatlia. Okay. 
And so we know that because it's a three Kali, three Osamatli. Now you count backwards all the way to three Osamatli, from one Kuat all the way back to three Osamatli. And then we correlate it to the Julian calendar. And by the way, this is the only time that we really have to do that, correlated to the Julian, because there's no reason after that. Because what, what he did here is he looked, he said, wait a minute, you know, 312, 312 is very close to the spring equinox. And so what he did is he went ahead and looked. There's another website called Time and Dates. And this website shows you, this is a really important website. It shows you all of the different equinoxes and solstices, okay, for like thousands of years. But you have to ha you have to make sure it's set on Mexico City, okay? Otherwise, it's not going to be giving you the the answer that the the, the time the, the time that we're looking for because the calendar is correlated to Mexico time. So look, three twelfth, August twelfth, fifteen twenty one. Fifteen twenty one. Okay, so for some reason it's a 24 hour clock, but let's go ahead and convert it so that we can see what time that is if you're not familiar with army time. So it's actually 10.45 p.m. using 10 hour clock, okay? 10.45 p.m. So what will happen if you think back to the Stellarium, right, program, 1045 is nighttime. This Teocali and all of the Teocalis in Mexico are tracking the sun. There is no sun at nighttime. And so a lot of people will say, well, the spring equinox happened at 1045. So that means that <clears throat> since it happened at 1045 at night, that means the new year should be March 11th. It's not the case. The new year happens to be March 12th, remember? And that's because and the observable spring equinox was the next day, okay? So it happened at night, but the uh, Mashika did not see it until they woke up in the morning, went to their observatory, and looked. And then they saw, oh, it's the spring equinox. So again, even though it occurred on March 10th, this is a hyper-technical definition. Uh, it's a modern definition of the spring equinox, okay? Because, I mean, we know this, we can we can calculate this now because of NASA and all the tools that we have. Back then, 1521, they couldn't do it. There's no evidence that they could know what, that the spring equinox was there because <clears throat> how, how would they know this? the sun was on the other side of the world, right? There's no way that they would know. And so we have to think in this decolonial view, right? We have to think like them. Like, how, how would they perceive the world? What kind of tools would they have available to them? And so, in this case, <clears throat> March 11th would be the observable spring equinox, and therefore that's why March 12th is going to be the new year. Now, this discovery is extremely profound because, because Reuben discovered this, well, we don't need the Gregorian anymore. We don't need the Gregorian calendar. Okay, this is it. We don't need it anymore because you could you will know what the correct calendar is just by saying, does it start the day after the observable spring equinox? If it doesn't, it's wrong. If it does, we're good. As long as we're starting with the correct days, right? As long as you, if you start with the right date, the day after the spring equinox, that is a good calendar and it's 100% accurate because as I said in in lesson one, a cal the whole purpose of a calendar is to mark time <clears throat> and to keep the calendar and the, the marking of time in line with the sun. If your year does not start one day after the observable equinox, then something is wrong. 
And so a lot of, as I mentioned, a lot of different things could lead to that error. But this is how we know the Ruben Ochoa correlation is the one from Mexico Tenochtitlan because we started on the same starting days and we started uh, at the same time, the day after the observable spring equinox. So let me go back here uh, to reiterate the point. So if we're counting backwards, you know, we're going through all of these days. 1519, there's another really important date. And that was when the Spaniards arrived into Tenochtitlan for the first time. A very, very momentous event. You can look at you can look at Alfonso Caso's research. These are his important days. Another very reliable day because all the Spaniards and all the native people wrote the date down. All right, in the Tonapuali, it's eight eheka. And in the Julian calendar, utilized by the Spaniards, November 8th, 1519. Okay, so we got two very reliable dates. Now, let's go up and we're gonna do the same exercise on this date, on the 1519 year. And let's see what happens. So the date starts on March 12th. On a day one, Sipakli, once again, go back to the lesson one if you're not sure why, but one Sipakli has to always match one e Aka. So that's how we know it's the, the beginning. And so we have uh, 3 12, March 12th. Let's go ahead and check it out. 15 19. Here. And it said it started on March 12th. Well, the spring equinox happened on March 11th. Okay. And it happened at 11.09 in the morning. Okay. And so what does that mean? That means that at 11.09 in the morning, our ancestors went to, you know, the Templo Mayor, Mexico Tenochtitlan, they looked and they saw that it was 11.09. At 11.09, it was the spring equinox. So that is so important because that tells us that they were able to see the spring equinox up until this time, 11.09. And this happens to be the cutoff point, right? Like they wouldn't be able to see it at any time after that. If we look at the patterns as we go, we, we will notice that. You know, if, for example, if the spring equinox is at 1 p.m., they wouldn't have seen it. it would be it, They wouldn't see it till the next day. So this is really important because this is the cutoff time. This is the latest possible time that you could have seen the spring equinox. And I'm going to show you why. So this is an image from... Curry Tlapayawa's uh, calendar, I'm sure many of you have uh, heard of it or use it. And it's a wall calendar. And so something that's so important to understand with that cutoff time, that 11 a.m. cutoff time, right? So the sun is here. One thing I told you already is that there is a distance from the ground to the top of the Templo Mayor. You see that? So we have to account for that. We account for that by saying, okay, maybe the sun rose on that day, uh, let's say at 651 or something, right? Something like that, an estimate. Well, it would be here at the horizon. But because of the height of the Templo Mayor, you know, time is going to pass until the sun is here. And so based on what we just saw, we know that the, the sun would be at the top, very top of the temple at 11. What was it? 1109, right? 1109. Now, the observer is not standing here. The observer is not standing on the Templo Mayor. The observer, by the way, um, Anthony Aveni and many archaeo uh, astronomers have proven that 
the on the top of the Temple of Mars. Remember how I said that there were, there were markers, right? I said there were markers. Well, this was the ast astronomical marker. Yes, there was a temple for Tlaloc, blue one, and then there's a temple for Huizalopochtli, the, the red one. Everything is so tight because Huizalopochtli is in charge of the dry season, but Tlaloc is in charge of the wet season. Okay, and so you have this situation where the, the yes, they're the temples for the Lalok and Wichilopochtli, very important, yes, but they're also the markers, the, the, the markers for the sun. So this is how the, the priest would be able to see it, but you cannot see it standing here, okay? And so what, and we know this because it was documented in a, a lot of the, the codices, but they would stand here, actually, in, inside this little observatory inside this little observatory this is the temple of Quetzalcoatl by the way and it is uh, in front of the temple of Mayor and as you can see it's a good distance away from it right and so something important to notice is that the priest is not looking at the the sun as it's rising right he's looking at it here and so that's why, for example, if if the spring equinox happened at 7 o'clock, 7 a.m., right? Well, by the time the sun got there, the priest will be able to see it, right? If it happened at 8 a.m., again, by the time the sun got to the top, they would, he would be able to see it as well. 9, 10, right? And then 11 becomes the cutoff point because... The sun would then be leaving the markers, right? And you would no longer be able to use the markers to tell if there's a spring equinox. So like I said, if the equinox happened at 1 p.m., the priest would not know because they're, the sun is not no longer on the marker. You see what I mean? And so that's why there's that's why that 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 year is so important, that 1519, so we can establish a baseline. And when we follow the calendar, it automatically just follows that pattern. Anything after 12, 1, 2, 3 p.m., 4 p.m. is going to be observed the next day. Okay, and this is the reason why. Priest is here. And he's standing here. He's looking at the sun at an angle, right? He's looking at it like that. He's looking up at the sun. And so that's the explanation for that. This is the cutoff time. Anything after that, it's going to be too late. And we can see that naturally happen as we as we look at the, the uh, years as they go. So that is the spring equinox. That's how we can tell when the spring equinox is. That's how we can tell uh, what the cutoff is and also when to start our year. Now, if we think about it for a minute, let, let's think about this because... Uh, this year is a is a leap year, right? So, and this is the thing that got a lot of people asking me. They said, "Why is this date duplicated?" <laughs> right? They said, uh, "Some someone said, oh, I think it's an error.' <laughs> I thought it was an error, <laughs> and uh, no, it's not an error. It's completely intentional, right? Because what happens is, you if you look at the Again, utilizing the, the marker in Mexico, you look on the 20th, right, for for this year, you're not going to see the spring equinox. And so you will see the spring equinox on the 21st, which, which makes sense as to why they were using uh, the spring equinox at, to determine whether there will be a new year. Because as you learned <clears throat> before in the previous lessons, there sometimes you have to include a leap day, which is what this is, right? All right, sisters, <clears throat> and in that decolonial colonial view, would not have seen it as like a leap day in the same way as a European. They saw it more as like a day that was stretched out, right, a, or duplicated, a day that was stretched out or duplicated. That's what they would. So it's just a longer day, okay? And then, uh, and then the next day you'd be able to see it. Now we can confirm that by going back to this website. 
And let's go to this year. And so here we go, 2023, okay? So it's March 20th is when we see, or when the spring equinox happens. This is 1524. And to my point that I just made, you know, we're going to see that very clearly happening right now. So I'm going to put 1524, and let's convert it. 1524. To 12 hour. And you see that? The new year happened at, I mean, I'm sorry, the spring equinox happened at 324 p.m. That is, the sun is going to be already over here and we're not going to be able to see it. It's past that cutoff point, which is how, which is how we know, okay, it's past the cutoff point. It's not going to be here. When the when we look in the morning, though, using our Theokali astronomical markers, we will be able to see the the spring equinox, and therefore that is why the new year starts here, eleven C Buckley. So it's a much more it's a much more complicated explanation than most people have time for. But if you're watching my video, that's because you probably ask me questions and you know you're interested in it. So that's why I'm making this video for you. So now I hope you understand uh, all the intricacies of it, okay? That cutoff, don't forget that cutoff time is very important. And I'll just go back here to the Stellarium program real quick to really drive home the point. So let's go to today's date, all right? Okay, so it's seven o'clock, <clears throat> boom, we can see it on the marker. By eight o'clock, look look how far the sun is already. It's so it's over here. Now keep in keep in mind the Temple of my order was way bigger than this, right? I, I don't know have the exact <clears throat> dimensions or anything, but I'm gonna skip over to three o'clock. And look, look where the sun is. See that? The sun is way too far to be able to see against our astronomical marker. And so that's what I'm talking about. That's why that cutoff point is so important. Where, where the sun leaves the, the Great Pyramid. Okay. Now, you know, I love critics because, I mean, not all critics. I love the critics that actually understand what we're saying so that they can critique it and give their feedback because that's really important. That's a really important thing. I remember there was um, there was a person online a long many years ago, and when we when I first proposed this calendar correlation, she her name was Sidlalin Shochime. She was a professor, very smart, and one thing she said was, "Well, look at the sun." How the, how the hell are they supposed to know? Look how much glare there is in the sun, right? How can they how can they observe it so precisely to know that it's the spring equinox? Because there's a very little, there's a very tiny difference between the day before the spring equinox, the spring equinox, and the day after. And she, her argument was like, well, they wouldn't, they wouldn't be able to have seen it because of the glare of the sun. You can't even stare at the sun, right? Like you stare at the sun, you go blind. And so that was a very good point that she made. And so we have to address it because how would they be able to see it? You know, the big sun? These we really think these people are looking at the sun. They're, you know, within a few minutes, they're going blind, right? So something else must be happening. And so Curly Talapu Yawa has done a lot of research on this. And he says that he's going to be making a video, so hopefully that comes out soon, to talk more about it. But we've got this thing called the Tlachi Loni, and it was used by the astronomers in pre-Columbian times to, to observe astronomical phenomena, including the sun. Here is one image uh, of, a, of one such astronomer in the Teokali, and 
looking, it look, kind of looks like a, like a crosshair. You see that? It's like crosshairs, right? And that's how they're getting their precise measurements when the sun reaches a particular point within the crosshairs, right? A lot of, there are several of these, especially mostly in the Mishteka codices. This is a Mishteka uh, codex. If you want to look it up, it's called the Bodli. And there's several image of them, images of them where they're they're just observing, right? In this case, he's using a like a crosshair tool. And this other example I have on the next one. It's actually um Here, no, where is it at? Hold on, let me play this real quick, sorry. Okay, so you've got this. Oh, maybe I took it out, sorry. Well, th there was another one that looked like this. Okay, so you, it's, uh, again, same codex. Now this one, instead of using a, a tool, uh, they were using uh, like a mountain. There's like a mountain. And this is the sun right here. And we know this is really important because we know that a lot of uh, Native people, including all the way to the Southwest, the Hopi and so many Native groups, use, just use the actual geographies. You know, you didn't, they didn't have to make the Okali to track it. They didn't even have to put make anything out of stone or put a stick in the ground. You know, you look at the mountains and the natural scenery, and that can be a marker. And so a lot of groups did that. And so this is uh, one such example. I'm like, okay, we don't have a Teokali, but we can use the mountains, right, to tell us when it's spring equinox. All that to say, <clears throat> there is sufficient evidence to show that they were utilizing some kind of tool to observe the sun and observe it safely, right? This is, um, is a, a very common tool. A lot of the, the, the Teo have this tool and it's kind of like, you know, you got the outer part of it and you can imagine maybe it would be used to block out the sun, right? And then you can only see a little bit here. This is uh, from the Codex Borgia. This is really fascinating because this is, but this is a Itzli, uh, the priest astronomer, observing the sun. And this page happens to correspond to the first month of the year at like a Shippa Walisli. And look, there he's observing the sun, just like we're saying that they did, right? They obviously had to because we just derived it from looking at the, the, the dates, the castle dates. So I'm going to show you a video that Ruben Ochoa made because he's got a hypothesis that they probably used obsidian and obsidian, he, he, he has tested it out and it protects your eyes from the sun. And not only that, but wow, it really narrows the sun down so that you can see it very precisely against, you know, these crosshairs or the Temple of Mayor, whatever the, whatever the tool is, you have to narrow it down and check this out. Check how, just look how, how, how tiny the sun gets in these videos. So here's one, this is obsidian glass. So you can see the sun there, it's very small. Look at this, it's even thicker obsidian glass. Look how small the sun is, look. Do you see that? <laughs> so would they be able to see it against their, their astronomical markers? Yes, the most definitely, if they're using a tool like that, most definitely you could get a very, very precise reading, okay? And you'd be able to know where exactly it is in relation to the to the year. Speaking of year, I'm gonna go ahead. So that was the that was just anchoring and knowing why we say the the day after the, the observable spring equinox in Mexico. I'm gonna go ahead and show you now the leap year because I had a, a somebody. A lot of people were asking me, well, why? Because people have noticed that the leap year started in Akkad, 
and then it's no longer an akat. Like I just showed you my planner. Let me go back to it here. Okay, so we're we're not in a. a Akat year right now, it's actually a Tochli year. We're in a Tochli year. So somebody asked me, well, if you if you apply the leap year to Akat, why is it why is it why is it move? Why is it move year bears? Akat, Tochli, it goes back and forth. That's a really good question. I'm gonna answer that next. Because that question actually leads us into Again, in this decolonized view of the calendar, why, why we don't even have to have a secondary correction, right? Like this, Rafael Tena, he doesn't have a secondary correction. As an example of a secondary correction would be like the Gregorian, for example. Okay, the Julian has these leap years. In 100 or so years, it accumulates into an error, a one-day error. What they do to... Um, to correct that now with the Gregorian is in certain years, they actually skip the leap year. <laughs> in certain years, they don't have a leap year. And so that prevents the, the error from ever accumulating, right? Now, the really crazy thing about our calendar, the Mexica uh, calendar, Mexica Azteca calendar, is that there's never a secondary correction that is needed, okay? And... If you remember from my, my first video that I made, I was talking a lot about the, the natural mathematical patterns that kind of just arise from starting with one seat lane counting. That happens again with the leap year. And so we have these two dates, okay? The, the day that the Spaniards entered um, Tenochtitlan, which was in 1519. And then we have the day in which they Tenochtitlan fell, which happened in 1521. Something I noted before in the Caso video is you cannot get that from this date, 1519 to 1521, unless you have a leap year in between. So that means that we either have to have a leap year here or here. Those are our two options. And so this is how Ruben discovered the leap year correction and because we know every calendar has to have that, that correction every four years but we don't know when did it when is it supposed to occur right like that that's like that's a critical question like where do we put it Kali we put it in Tekpa we put it Akat or maybe even the, the fourth one you know that that's not listed here which is what is that the Tochli maybe it's in a Tochli year right we don't know well when you look at all of these three dates, these three years, we are we've already established just from this one that you have to have uh, the year start one day after the observable spring equinox in Mexico Tenochtitlan. So we know that every single year has to have that pattern, right? Well, here's the thing: Ruben discovered that the the leap year for this year, fifteen nineteen must be applied to the Akat year. It has to be. Because if it's not applied to the Akat year, what will happen is the two Tekpat year would actually start on the wrong day. And so that's how we know it has to be on Akat. And when we add the leap day to Akat, we successfully get from the entrance of the Spaniards into Tenochtitlan and then we to the fall of the Tenochtitlan, no problem, okay? But more, even more important than that, this day here is one day after the observable equinox in Mexico Tenochtitlan. I'm going to show you. This... Is the cat is this is the leap day right here that's been added? And remember, it's a double, it's a duplicate of that that same day. And it's right there. Okay. I just told you that this is one day after the observable equinox. Well, watch what happens 
if we don't include this day, right? If we don't include one koat, well, then this day actually becomes two mekisli. Okay, so this day is two mekisli. And why is that a problem? Well, like I said, two mekisli would be here. The problem with that is if we look on time and date, Three uh, March 11, 1520 is the observable equinox in Mexico, Tenochtitlan. It is that day. And so it, we would have this day starting on the day of the equinox, which we can't have. And so that's how we know the leap day has to go on Akkad and not Tekfat. And I'll prove it to you with uh, the time and date for, like I said, it's observable in Mexico on 311, right? So let's go and check. 3-11-15-19. Sorry, I said 15-19, but I meant to say 15-20. Okay, so March 11, 15-20. Let's check it out. Okay, so this is 17, this is military time, so that means that this is like 12, this is like 5 p.m., 4 or 5 p.m., okay, on March 10th, for the spring equinox, the actual spring equinox, 4 or 5 p.m. Which, as we know, it happened at, let's say, 4 p.m., right? That's after the uh, the 11 o'clock cutoff, right? And so it would not be observed here on 10. It would be observed at 11. Okay? Which, again, if we don't apply this leap day, this is, this actually is two mikisli. And that doesn't make any sense that two of the, the days would be um, after the observable spring equinox and the other one, the other one wouldn't. And so we can say with certainty then in 1519, the Mashika they applied a, a leap day here in order to keep, you know, to keep the calendar um, <clears throat> synchronized with the sun. And that's how we know it was Akkad year. Okay. And so we just follow that pattern. Akkad. Akkad has a leap day. Akkad has a leap day over and over again. And Ruben Ochoa has painstakingly charted this like these days like i did right here he has charted these for several years and that's how he discovered that after 32 years you go let me uh let me let me go to that document okay so you have 32 years you have uh one leap day here this is 1519 that's the one i just showed you and we're going to do it every four years. So it's going to be on the same uh, year bearer. It's on an Akat. So look, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Eight times four is 32, right? So in uh, like 30, in 32 years, then the, the leap, the, the leap day was applied to the Akat. Now, if you, so everything is calibrated. But then, you know, what happens, and I encourage you to kind of chart this on your own to, you know, look at look for it, look at it with your own eyes. You know, people have asked me for homework sometime. That that's the homework that I would give you, you know. Chart all the days all the way to 1540, uh 50, 52. And then what you're gonna see utilizing the time and date. You're going to see that you cannot apply the, the leap day anymore to the Akat year because what will happen is the subsequent days will no longer be one day after the spring equinox. They will actually fall away. And so what, what's happening then is the leap day, the leap day shifts. 
Okay, after uh, eight cycles, it's going to shift to the next year bearer. Okay, after eight cycles. And it's going to go for eight more. I'll show you. So we got um, thick butt. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And then it's going to shift to Kali. The if you if you know if you know the order you know that it's going in or in the in the correct order, that's the order of the year bearers. So it's kind of shifting from one year bearer to the next. Now the really important thing that you want to take away from this, I mean, obviously that it explains it explains why the leap year is not always on akat, right? It's just this natural mathematical pattern. How or why does it exist? I don't know, but it works every single time. And it, again, we're we're just following the pattern of 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 the leap days, right? Like if we don't apply them to the to the to the different year bearers, it the the years go get wacky and and they don't fall one day after the observable spring equinox. But one thing I want to point out that's really important is in that when you shift. During that shift, see that shift, you have a leap day. Instead of every four years, right? It's happening on the fifth year now. So this is why there's no need to have a secondary correction like the group, like the Gregorian calendar, for example, because instead of every four year, four years, we have a leap day, it shifts to five years every 33 years. And so since that shift is happening, it, the, the calendar actually just corrects itself actually. <laughs> and so it just stays in line completely just on its own. And so that, that makes it really cool and really nice that we don't have to put an arbitrary or imaginary correction to it because it just corrects itself naturally. If, of course, we're staying with that concept that the year starts one day after the observable equinox. Okay, so I know that was a lot of information. Check it out. I know you probably have some more questions. I think I covered everything I wanted to cover. I wanted to cover the nature of the spring equinox. How do you observe it? How can we double check? What programs can we use to verify our work? And then why do the why do the leap days change year bearers? Okay. And so I really hope you enjoyed this video. The the new year is tomorrow, 322. So I hope you have a, a great new year. So that's March 22nd, tomorrow. And today is the last day of the year, Matalakli Tochli, 10 Rabbit. And so tomorrow we're going to start Matalakli Se Akat. Going back to an Akat year. So as you saw in the first video of the series, the, the Donali has to match the numeral, and the Sipakli always has to match the the year bear, Aka. We always start with one Talakashipa Walisli. Somebody asked me, hey, uh, I want to learn more about the months. Because I, 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 if you notice, I have not talked about the months, just the um, Donapuali. The reason for that is, and this is the this is the thing that makes it really difficult for people. The the calendar is composed of the Tonalpuali and the Shiopuali. It's two separate components. And so the it's ba it's ba it's literally just two calendars mixed together basically is what's happening. The Tonal Puali is synced very tightly with the Shio Puali. And so if you want to know what the day is, you can say you can use the Shio Puali and you can say, well, the day tomorrow is Se Telakashipawalisli. The first day of of um people are flayed. Or the flaying of people actually would be a more precise way of saying that. 
And then another person can say, no, tomorrow is not, or tomorrow is 11 crocodile. <laughs> and they'll both be correct. One person is utilizing the Tanal Puali, 11 cock crocodile. The other person is using the Shio Puali, one Talaka Shio Puali. And so that's why I covered just the Tanal Puali first. So that, because everything is synced to the Tanal Puali and everything, for me, I, I think it's the most important um the important aspect of the calendar just because it's connected to you know birth signs and it's just it's just connected to like even if you're gonna have a good day or what that they are in charge of that day the months are important as well but I'll get that I'll get to that in a future in a future video like how do we know because that, that's an entirely different conversation right like how do we know that the months are are synced and so that so that requires a whole nother <laughs> discussion. And so I just wanted to keep it simple, just focus on the Tanal Puali. This is uh this is the end of the, the series. I hope that you can see in this video, you know, the beauty of just thinking about it in terms of a 100 percent indigenous view. We're not saying that the day is starting on March 22nd, right? We're saying the day is starting, um, the new year is starting one day after the observable spring equinox in Mexico Tenochtitlan. There's a difference, right? We're saying that. And so that's how we decolonize our, our calendar. And that's how we understand that all of these symbols and all this work, the beautiful work that our ancestors did in the Teokali and the, and the Codices and the Amoshli, it's all there for us. It's all valuable. We can all study it and understand uh, how they saw how they saw the, the world. And it's such a beautiful thing. And so I covered, I hope I covered everything. Uh, hopefully I answered all of your questions. And uh, I hope you all have a, a very happy new year. And uh, that's Kamati for watching.